Thanks to all of you for being here this evening. I'm KB Jones. I'm professor of architecture here at the Knowlton School. Um, and at this point, I'm the longest surviving faculty member at the Knowlton School. Woo! <laughs> it's an awesome. <laughs> It's an auspicious thing to consider on Dios de los Muertos. <laughs> it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome Tatiana Bilbao back to the Noten School of Architecture, this time as the Baumer Fellow. I'm going to be very brief, since you're all here to hear from her and not from me, but I would be remiss to not extend my thanks to many who have made her visit possible. And they include the Herber Herbert Baumer Fund that supports this long running program. And I challenge you to locate a portrait of Herbert Baumer in this building. I saw it today for the first time. I want to thank the Knowlton School's superb staff who have been enormously helpful. And I begin with Jamie Mollison and including Casey Becker, Carla Sharon, Clint Tomlinson, of course, Zach Mariana, we will long miss you, Phil Arnold, Ben Wilkie, Neda Tebetabai, and from ETS, Jason Matthews and Numnu Muhammad. Thanks to all of you for making this run so well. Freedom, <laughs> more applause. Freedom a la carte has provided us with great food for our conversations around a dining table. And the G3s are knocking it out of the park. Thanks to all of you for your hard work and dedication this week. And especially I want to thank Todd Gannon. He recognized that Tatiana and her work are exactly what we need right now and for convincing Tatiana to come. Tatiana, you are a rock star of cooperative housing design. You ask of us nothing small, only to rethink the way we live and then to rethink we presume the way others live. Tatiana is shifting the paradigm away from colonizing practices of top-down ordering systems while then questioning the relations of client, sponsor, dweller, and designer, all things that we tend to take for granted. She's even challenging our favorite conventions for visually communicating our ideas. She stands on the shoulders of the likes of Dolores Hayden, while raising the voices of Elise Iturbe, Silvia Fernandez, Pierre Vittoria Aurelie, and those who contest the city of carbon form. Tatiana is teaching us that the post-COVID city must be the city of care, which she will explain this evening. She began Tatiana Bilbao Studio in Mexico City in 2004, and since then, her built work has been published worldwide, including the New York Times, A Plus U, Arc Daily, Dezine, and others. She's exhibited everywhere from the Venice Biennale, the Graham Foundation, the Chicago Biennial, and the Louisiana Museum in Copenhagen to more recent shows in Madrid and Melbourne. She has a recurring teaching assignment at the Yale School of Architecture. She has taught at Harvard GSD, Columbia GSAP, Rice, the AA in London, in Chile, and in Dusseldorf. Tatiana is busy, but nonetheless, she took the time to Zoom with us on her phone from a time zone 12 hours away. We saw the seatbelt while she was on the car, and I was terrified that she was also driving. <laughs> Much relieved to learn that she had a driver. I'm not going to reread her many accolades and awards. You can read them on the KSA site. Otherwise, we'd be here all night. Let me ask you to join me in welcoming Tatiana. Thank you very much. Um, it is my honor and pleasure to be here again. <laughs> um, I do remember when I was here, it was 2017, and I spoke on the concept of alterity. And, um, and a lot has happened since then. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, five years after, for those who were here, you will hear a uh, a, a renewed story or an evoluted story. Um, for those who were not here, he, I wanted to speak today about um, kind of the ideas that are now uh, being uh, the, the things that are um, found, find, found uh, in deep our, our thought in the office. 
Almost six years ago, I, was, um, I received a call from Patrick Killian, a Cistercian monk from a, an abbey in Austria called Heiligenkreuz, asking me if I would be interested in um, designing a new monastery for their order. Obviously for me, um, it has become not only a lifetime project, it has become a life-changing project. I, did, I really uh, understood that the, the monastery is the ultimate domestic space. I believe it's the only typology I have ever encountered that it's truly dedicated to hold a body to exist in it, all its extents of the word. And I believe that um, it's not only about the physical aspect, it's also about the As I said, not only holds a physical body, it holds uh, a ritual that, uh, that obviously the allow the monks to exist in this physical life in order to live their spiritual life. <laughs> It's been six years that I have had to imagine or to understand what are the capabilities of a building in order to do that.
I think. Um, of course, I'm not here to, uh, to convince anybody to become a monk uh, or a nun, um, although I think their life is pretty cool. Um, neither to promote any type of ritual or anything or any type of religion. I just really um, want to share uh, really two very important uh, aspects of what I understood uh, a monastery building is able to do for the life of the monks. And, um, and therefore, I think they should be uh, really um, a rethought and exemplified to inform much more our domestic environment. I think this is on. And this was maybe, maybe. Yeah, like that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you. We need to see him watch this lecture, so I'm going to call him again because he's, <laughs> he's leaving. <laughs> so, um, of course, we have studied in these six, past six years uh, everything that has to do with uh, Cistercian architecture, and it has been an incredible journey to understand all of it and understand where it's come and how it has done, and uh, at the moment, how it has built. Um, the, the incredible thing is that they built uh, in the course of two, one to two centuries, 300 monasteries uh, in the 11th century, 11th and 12th century. And they all based um, in the same plan. Uh, the plan, uh, it's um, uh, exactly what allows this ritual to exist. Obviously, we don't understand what came first if the space or the ritual, how it's performed. But it's a space that not only allows this ritual to exist, it comprehends and holds the necessities of the physical body in, able, in order to enable those, um, those uh, rituals to happen. It is amazingly how the building really follows the day of the year and the, uh, and the time of the year, the season. Um, uh, allowing the activities to happen where the uh, following the light and the rhythm of the day. That is an incredible thing that the majority of our, our buildings are not um, following. And I'm not going to really specify on how our design is moving forward. Um, as I said, it has been an amazing journey and we're om almost in a con conceptual phase still. But uh, because I think it's less important, we're obviously responding to a very prescript, prescribed typology that we're not pretending to reinvent or change. We're just trying to understand it, to follow it, and to think what is that building of the 21st century. There have been little adjustments, um, uh, but in general, the way the monks lives are almost the same since the 11th century. So we, as I said, don't pretend to, um, to define anything different from that. When I think of the, the most important aspects that I believe it could be translated into our domestic environment and could really form and hold our bodies much uh, more intensively, allowing them a much more sustained way of living, is the aspect that the, the, the building understands and the ritual understands that all of us are both individual and social beings, meaning that we need the, the balance on the two of them to exist. We need our individual intimate space to nurture our bodies uh, that can only happen within ourselves physically, sleeping, resting, um, our bodies regenerating, etc. And on the other hand, we need the other because we're not autonomous human beings to take care of us. We need the other to br bring us up. We need the other to help us um, exist also when, uh, when we age. We need the other in order to, to really survive. So the monastery, the monastery really understands that, you know, understands how to protect an individual intimate body and soul and then how to really allow it to become social. Um, the, the, the most important protective layer for our own bodies is first of all, the, the, the clothes we wear. And second of all, the first shell that we have on top of our heads. 
So they understand that obviously the robe is a very important identity piece, but that is not actually um, their physical expression. Uh, it's because it's the first layer of protection and they see it uh, as a space that holds a body. Then they inhabit with that body, with that robe, inhabits in this cell, which is the second layer of protection for that body. That cell is inserted in a cloister, and when the cell, um, and when you open the door of your cells, the first moment of um, interaction with another human being. That uh, a other human being is one of your brothers, which is an intimate circle. Then that cloister is um, linked to the more social programs, let's say social, in the monastery, which is the reflectory, the chapter room, the sacristy, um, the library, the learning room, etc. And uh, those are where the community of the monastery uh, are allowed to, to, to be. Then that, uh, those are connected to the church, and the church is where the community from the exterior comes in. So this is when the monks are able to see the community from the exterior. The day progresses exactly in the same direction. So the monks goes from their bare body to the robe and from the cell to the cloister and from the cloister to the, most, uh, to the more commun communal spaces in the compound to the church. And the other way around through the whole day like that in stages by hours is not uh, something that happens directly, it's not binary, it's not that the, at one point they are in their cell and the next they open the door and they're in the church full of people of the community. They go in stages both in and out. This allows them to prepare themselves both physically and, and mentally for the social interaction, but also that creates a possibility of understanding different types of communities that need to be created in order to hold a body to exist. In the monasteries, it's very hard to find binaries, although one might, might think it's full of binaries because it's in or out, no? But I think if you really go in deep and understand it, at least in the Cistercians, I, I cannot generalize because I don't know any more, uh, that better other orders, uh, it is a system of, uh, that progresses itself, which I think it's incredibly beautiful. The other aspect that I really learned is um, that, um, or I really was able to put in words. I, have all, I think I have always been trying to understand this aspect, um, but I never had been able to see it or put it in words, that um, for the monks there's nothing habitual. Everything is ritualistic. Everything has a ritual and everything means something. It's, it's, it, it represents something. And even, even eating, sleeping, everything is not a habit, it's a ritual. And I think that this is something that for me has been allowed me to really think on our domestic environment where we have really standardized um, a, and a kind of defined habits that we could say we all share in order to uh, standardize and homogenize the way we shall inhabit this planet. And I think that this is key because all of us, not only we need rituals to exist, we do all have different rituals in life. The monks have a very specific one and therefore their building is a very specific for their own use. Um, so what are those in our society? It's hard to define and that's the point. We, try, we eliminated them because we cannot define them. We need to allow everything to exist, but then we uh, standardized uh, those habits that we were, are supposed to um, have the same way, all of us. We have been working, as I said, in these two topics uh, in different ways in the office since ever. And I think that after learning from the monastery much more presently, we have carried on the, all those topics. Um, we we um, started working for Olive West, which was uh, in parallel as the monks, as the monastery. Uh, this is a project in St. Louis, Missouri, 
we uh, really thought that there would be a necessity to understand how to create a possible idea of inhabiting a block uh, in, uh, in this Midwest city of the United States that typically has uh, these blocks that uh, you can find in many uh, cities uh, in the US where the blocks is full of single houses just facing the street, surrounded with a piece of lawn and um, uh, just uh, hyper binary, no? creating a very private space that is inhabited only by the, its owners or its users and then open it uh, to the street which is completely public and collective. We then got a, a block of, um, uh, of, that, uh, of that fabric of city in the neighborhood in, in the west um, area of St. Louis, Missouri, and in the west, central west end. And um, what we decided is to understand how to create, yes, those private spaces, but with interstitial spaces that could start to promote different types of a relationship between those inhabitants there and possibly have platforms or other relationships to exist. So we designed this block, we shift the position of the houses in order to allow much more interstitial spaces uh, that could potentially serve for other um, uh, relationships, as I said, with other scales and different types of spaces that could intermingle in the, in the whole block. So we, we designed a master plan with that, well, I hate the term master plan, but we, can, we designed the layout of that. And um, as I said, we intersected the homes that we, um, also the houses that we um, commissioned to three different uh, other architects uh, with semi-collective spaces, sem some semi, semi uh, uh, individual spaces, some semi-collective, some semi-social, and some more, uh, much more social. So, for example, we have a, an area with a pool, which is a, a much more collective space within the community. Everybody um, is, a, a, it's accessible to everybody. It hold, it can hold the whole community. Or we have like this park that it's open even to the, um, to the public, to the, to the street. Or we have more spaces that are uh, allowed to be used by the whole community, but they're smaller, so uh, immediately more uh, the use would be more focused and uh, less shared as the as the big pool. We have also an edible garden, which is uh, for the whole community, but it's taken care of specifically by some part of the community. And so we orchestrated these uh, interstitial spaces that really would. Uh, for us, at least create the possibility for different types of, um, of relationships. There's a grill at some point, there is a table uh, elsewhere, um, uh, there's the shared areas for the, the parking. Um, and what we did with our house is just a very simple move of having kind of the most secluded space, intimate space on the top. We turn it around uh, from the one in the bottom in order to create more intimacy and the one in the bottom to more open towards the exterior in order to allow much more direct relationships with the other sp open spaces for the community. Um, it's a very simple move, it's a very simple um, and kind of normative type of house, uh, but uh, we, by not only inviting different architects, this is a house by Productora, this is a house by Moss from New York, Productora from Mexico City, um, and then there's another house from Macias Peredo, um, and also giving kind of different possibilities of different types of, of houses, and I, they are very, very different interiorly. We thought we could give a little bit more possibilities of a, a more diverse community to find a different way of living. We really think, in a way, that uh, our cities um, are uh, composed by each of those architectures that the city holds. Every sidewalk, every bench, every light bulb, that is part of the, uh, of the city itself. So uh, often we think that uh, we architects uh, should think on the big picture of the city, what the city is. Uh, how it's defined and how it's planned, 
we're already doing it by doing an every architecture that we insert it there. So we need to think, no, what is the city that we're making, even if we're just intervening with a bent? That already is defining the architecture of the city. I grew up with the mantra, um, a, a, in the next 70 years, in the next 50 years, 70% 70 of the population is going to live in urban environments. I think the, the, the time has come. We are almost there. I don't know. I don't know the numbers. But um, in, even though we, we really um, uh, repeated ourselves that mantra, we were not able to imagine a project for the city. And of course, we were not able to imagine a project of like uh, the modern uh, ar architects uh, imagine for cities um, because, uh, and our excuse was that the city is uh, now designed by organic forces, by abstract forces, and that we, there's nothing we architects can do. Nevertheless, first of all, I don't think that those uh, abstract uh, or organic uh, forces can be called like that because they have nothing of organic or nothing of abstract. They are really market forces that are driving uh, how the sh cities are shaped and who can inhabit in them. And more and more, the majority of the population is expelled. So if we think that each of the architectures that we do is creating the possibility of city, then we shall think, who are we working for? Are we working for that people to be able to live in the city? Or are we working for those forces that have nothing of abstract that are market and capital forces that are expelling the majority? I think that now the new mantra uh, after the pandemic is what is a post-COVID city says, no, as K KBS was saying. Um, I think that uh, for me, uh, it's irrelevant to speak about that because I think the pandemic did nothing to our cities, just uh, exposed our problems and obviously took advantage of them. And we were able then to see them more clearly I think we should be talking really what is the post-carbon city, what is the post-production city, what is the city that is not designed to be surrendered to market and capital forces, and the city that is really uh, um, designed for holding our bodies to exist. We now live in a moment where um, this statement that I'm going to say is really taken into extreme. To exist, we need to produce. And if we don't produce, we cannot longer exist. For everything, we need money. We need money to eat. We need money to get uh, bring, bring, brought up. We need money to uh, learn. We need money to have a shelter. We need money to exist to cover our basic necessities. But the, but the irony and the problem comes when we think that to produce, we need to exist first. So I, I would really think that uh, we need to lay down a completely different city, a city that really uh, allows us first to exist, that has our necessities of existing together in order for, the, for those uh, to allow to produce. That's what the monks do with their building. They understand that if they don't hold their body understanding the, ryth the natural rhythm that the body needs to exist of food, of sleep, of rest, of washing, etc. They cannot perform the ritual life that they are commanded to live. So can't we think of the same? For me, that city is really a city that is uh, based on the idea that we exist. And paraphrasing Silvia Federici, uh, we need a revolution at point zero, the one that really understands the, the reproductive and care labor, uh, of course, the feminist struggle comes uh, along with it, and understand the house and um, the housework and the household as the most important structure uh, that defines, allows, and uh, really permits our existence. I um, I I was invited a, um, three years ago to a lecture uh, during the International Women's Day. Uh, in, in Oaxaca, a city in the southwest part of Mexico. Um, and when I was um, a called to that conference only by women architects, I was asked to present my work. 
uh, nothing specific, but I thought it was uh, more important to present my work with a perspective of um, uh, or, or a feminist perspective. How would my work advance topics of discrimination? How would my work really was able to erase um, um, uh, barriers or lines of discrimination to, towards women? And when I was putting the lecture together, I realized that not, my work not only had done anything to erase discriminations or to uh, really advance the topics of women in the cities, but it had done everything to perpetuate those discriminations that the system has. And that is because I had not really questioned our basic structure, the living one, in this sense. I had really not understood that um, the society that, to, that uh, we have today is based on the fact that reproductive and care labor is not recognized as labor. It's subsidizing the economy in order for people to be productive. This reproductive labor needs to happen and needs to happen without being recognized. Otherwise, it's not sustainable because um, in the system that we work would not allow that. I read uh, in the way also there an interesting article in the New York Times that had a figure saying that uh, reproductive and care labor in the United States um, calculated in three hours per day uh, done per, per person, person who does it, which I think it's even low, um, calculated in um, salary, minimum wage salary, would sum a, 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 a an, an amount which I can barely say is like $10 trillion or something like that. And that amount is the sum of 23 of the most important, the revenue of the two, of yearly revenue of the, adding 23 of the most important companies in the US. So this means that that labor is subsidizing this economy. So uh, if we think that, uh, we think of the, exactly the problem that our society is laid on. For that, uh, for that la labor economy to exist, there needs to be an invisible labor which is bigger, uh, a force that is larger in order to sustain it. Um, and the houses, the cities that we laid, they are that we have today, are all laid out to respond to that form of economy, which is the productive one. Our whole cities are designed in that sense. Even the house we live. The house we live is a response towards the work we do. So it's exactly the, the, the definition for the place of rest from that place of work. First of all, our houses are not places of rest, not even there have never been. It's where the most important job happens. But second of all, not being recognized and being put, you know, kind of that opposite to the place of work doesn't allow, you, allow us to advance any of the discrimination issues to the people who perform this work today. This work today is done 95% uh, by women. But still, I mean, if it's not recognized as paid labor, whoever does it is going to be discriminated from the economy. So I would say that to advance the equality issues, we need to talk about care. And us architects have the responsibility to create spaces for that. Right now, I think that we are only, and I, I declared myself guilty at that lecture, I still um, understand myself as that, of being the culprit of perpetuating the system that really uh, is just uh, allowing the productive system to exist and to feed itself. How then are we going to think differently about the spaces we built? First of all, I started challenging everything. Um, why do we automatically design spaces for living with kitchens? We all think that we all need to eat. Yes, sure, we do all need to eat, each of us. But why someone has to uh, cook for us in a specific kitchen uh, individually? And why do we design, decide that this is the kitchen that is the most efficient one for what? For what type of food, for what type of person, for what type of community, for what type of social arrangement. Yeah, we are standardizing uh, the idea of living uh, by defining a, a household with an heteropatriarchal family, and that is how our built environment is completely laid down. Uh, 
a task that serves for the productive system because that is able to uh, create more efficiently productive human beings, but that doesn't serve for anything else. It doesn't really um, allow for nothing else to happen. And the worst part is that only the minority of the population uh, really can exist in that type of uh, dwelling in a good way, let's say, uh, with a comfortable, privileged uh, situation that allows them to have that environment as a healthy one, which is the minimum. And I don't think even those are, you know, kind of um, happy, let's say. For me, the, the Mayan example produces like really an immediate understanding for that is to reduce the idea into a line, which is obviously not possible, but I think that is very illustrative. In Mexico, a housing is a constitutional right. The Constitution, the fourth article of the Constitution says that every family, here's again the problem, has the right to enjoy a dignified, uh, has the right to have an enjoyable and dignified place to live. First of all, they have, they have voted to change the, uh, the Constitution and it, in order not to say family, it's gonna say person very soon. I don't know if already that happened. The vote happened, it was approved. So every person has the right to have an enjoyable and dignified place to live. The, the Constitution also recognizes that Mexico is conformed by 67 different cultures that collide in the, in the country. But then the law, the housing law, describes in the article number four of the housing law in the first uh, chapter, says that a house is that one who in, in the house has at minimum one kitchen, one bathroom, two bedrooms, and one living space. The Mayan community is one of those 67 cultures that are supposedly to be recognized in the Constitution, and they don't live like that. They have a really incredible form of living that has existed since millennia. This uh, civilization exists since 10,000 years ago, and that uh, it's completely linked to the Earth. It's a cyclical way of understanding how to live. It's a communal understanding of living. They don't have divisions of spaces with lab labels. They have a central hut where a lot of things happen depending on the day of the year and the, year, uh, the time of the year. Um, and they have individual areas for uh, single members. I'm not saying that's an equal society. I'm not saying it's a, an example. I'm just saying it's a specific one that has a specific culture. And um, they have like shared spaces that uh, where they do different shared activities, like cooking, like washing, like cleaning themselves. They, they don't sleep in beds, they sleep in hammocks. In the houses that the law describes as a house, which is the only ones that are recognized by the system, the only ones that are labeled as being able to be called property, the only ones that are subject to credit, to finance, and to subsidize are those who are described by the law. So their houses, cannot, they, they not fulfill the definition. So first of all, culturally, obviously they want to change because they want to be you know, called that they have a house, that they have a household. Um, not only that, they also want to belong to the system, but also they are forced to change even if they don't want to because if they need to accede to a, to a subsidy or to a credit to in the bank, they need to have a house that uh, fills in that definition. To do that, they have to change their culture that has happened for millennia, but not only that, their culture responds to their weather, to their specific territory. In that territory, the weather is hyper hot, it's 30 degrees centigrade year round. I'm sorry, I don't know that in Fahrenheit. The world is in centigrades, by the way. Um, <laughs> They, so it's 30 degrees, it's very, 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 very hot. It's very humid year round. So the hammock and the response on how they use the spaces interiorly and exteriorly responds to that condition. As soon as you impose the, 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 the way the law describes how to live, they cannot really uh, uh, sleep in hammocks because those rooms cannot hold a hammock, so they have to transform into sleeping in beds because those rooms are thought as to be uh, holding beds, 
And uh, when they sleep in beds, they are uh, not being able to rest very well because they cannot swing in the night. So now all of a sudden they need air conditioning. So all of a sudden they all need this kind of super infrastructure that is damaging the whole environment. So uh, is, this is to think, why do we need to define the house as this? And why are we architects have been the culprits to really reproduce this way of living without even thinking, just doing plants yeah, house needs a kitchen, a bathroom, uh, rooms. Have you ever stopped and thought that, we, yes, we do all need to sleep, but we don't all sleep the same way. And yes, we do all need bathrooms but to bathe, but we don't all need bathrooms to do that. And yes, we do all need to eat, but we don't all need to cook, and we don't all need kitchens that are solely for that. So we have been really thinking how to um, progress that conversation in many realms. And I'm, I'm going into an extent and something, and then going back now to an example we did way before. 2015, we were called to, uh, to uh, do a project in Spain that, um, that uh, would be a house to respond for uh, an unknown client and uh, that would be built in the forest. And that was exactly the premise of the project, that we would have exact freedom to design the house uh, that we wanted to design. And I, I was already thinking uh, since then that um, I really had no right to, to, to decide how anybody else should live. So I, I was always thinking how to do that, no? how to deal with this situation that I, for me was almost impossible to think that I could design someone for anybody else. Um, and I started thinking on how to design with that other, how to become that other, and that's why I spoke five years ago. Uh, until I realized that all those notions were actually uh, very innocent thoughts. It was already a, a, a base for thinking uh, how could someone else uh, live in some, some place that I would imagine. And then I understood that it's impossible to become that other, and it's innocent to think that you could become that other. So I thought, well, how then uh, to start thinking on creating an architecture that that other can uh, really um, inhabit it as is itself and not as myself. So the first thing we started experimenting in this house specifically because we didn't know also who was going to inhabit. Uh, and, at the, and in the beginning, as I said, for me that was really strange because I wanted to become that other to design. Um, and this was exactly the opportunity to do that. Okay, let's think, you know, that other, we would never know it. In this case, we really don't know it, but we will never know it and we will never become that other. So we said, okay, what, something we cannot get rid of is the, the aesthetical definition, no? So um, that is, even if you say, it's just a white box, that's an aesthetical definition. So that we cannot escape from it. We're gonna define it, we're gonna hold to that, but we're not gonna say for what is that intended to be used. We're not gonna direct it. So what we did is we created a square uh, that became a, a, a full volume with that, and we started uh, modifying that square in different shapes. Why? Because we liked it. Uh, we started um, kind of um, uh, put, stacking them together in order to create different uh, possibilities of that shape to exist. And then we spread it out in the landscape in order to have different relationship with the landscape. But we didn't decide what was those structures used to. They could be used in many different ways. And we started having problems when we needed to submit the plans to the municipality because they asked us for plans and sections. So we said, okay, now here we have a problem. How do we do plans and sections that don't direct how the space is done? We can do plans and sections of only the, the, um, the modules, but they would not give us a permit with that. So we, start, we started challenging the notions on how we draw um, in this, with this project, because also how we draw is directing people, uh, how we people inhabit the, the spaces. We draw a bathroom, that's a bathroom. We draw a kitchen, that's a kitchen. We draw, you know, and people even sometimes go to the plants to see how they move their sofa from their house. 
you know so that is how we are deciding how to inhabit that place but not the person who inhabits it itself we needed to create images so we asked one person in the office how would you live in this place and this is the the response but we also asked different people in the office and it was really incredible the the result and we like this drawing this is why i'm, I'm showing the ones from gonzalo mauleon who's one of them but really uh, our idea was to understand how to create a space that can be inhabited by one, by ten, by two people, uh, by one using uh, everything as, as open door spaces, by one using as closed door spaces, one using all of them rooms, etc., etc. At the end, uh, we also wanted to understand how to create tools to imagine also different possibilities. And that brings me to the next project, which um, it, it was um, also kind of a call for architects, the, the one, the other project is, is in Spain. Our house is not built, the, the, the project before this one. Um, our house, uh, I forgot to say, this is in Teurel, Spain, in the north of um, Catalonia, in the border with Aragon. And it's a project called Solo Houses, endeavored by, um, by a guy that commissioned 20 architects, 20 or so architects. Two houses are built, one by Petzo von Elrichhausen and one by Office from Belgium. Ours is not yet built, so I don't know how it works. In this case, there was also a couple of architects, Neraj Baita and uh, Christian Hesse, who called, uh, again, 20 or so architects to design a house in Germany uh, in a kind of an idyllic place for the new ways of life. This was 2017, and they were calling the new ways of life working and living in the same space, you know, because that was the time where home office started to emerge. This was pre-pandemic. Um, and for me, it was really weird because I thought, well, first of all, I don't see the house as a rest place. So it's living and working is the same thing. It happens still already in the house. Um, I see the house as uh, the place of mo the, where the most important work happens, as I explained. And second of all, uh, we have been working productively and reproductively in the spaces we inhabit since the start of humanity. So what is about this division, I don't understand. But what are we going to do? We're going to do a house for ways of life, for different ways of life. So we thought, OK, um, they had a brief that described exactly uh, you needed to respond to a house with these amount of square meters, with these uh, X rooms, no, a, a kitchen, a bathroom, two bedrooms, one living room, and one kind of working space. So I, w I said, OK. We're going to do a house that would promote different types of uses in the spaces because the spaces are going to hold di different sizes, different proportions, different relationship to the landscape, but we don't know what they're going to be used for. So we, under we kind of describe what are the activities or emotions that we wanted those spaces to produce. We draw them. We thought which spaces that we know in our heads promote those types of things. We describe them with words, uh, the, those six spaces that we wanted to design in this house. Then we collage these six spaces with the definition uh, that we put them in words. It was a very hard process because none of us would agree in that an image responded to a word. Um, and that was already something really interesting of the process. So we did the six collages. And um, when we had the six collages, we said, now what? How do we design a house from here? And we put them all together. We traced them. And this is the drawing that emerged. And then we said, OK, now what? How do we do a house from there? Uh, we started shaping a house. And we had the, 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 um, the deadline very close by. So we had to hurry up. And uh, so we have to wrap it up. We finished, and we delivered this. And I would say that I was very disappointed because when I saw this result, I thought, well, we could have arrived to, to the same conclusion, uh, just designing a house with the same precepts that we learn in school, um, and as a, a house that would have two, ba two bedrooms, one bathroom, one kitchen, and one, um, and one living space and one working space. To my surprise, a year later, um, Christian has a call and says, you know, Tatiana, there's um, two people very interested in building this house because they say that this is perfectly designed for their way of living. I was like, oh, yeah, what is that? Um, <laughs> and then they, I, I endeavor myself into a call with them, and they describe the house 
uh, with a, a certain uh, types of different uses in the, among the spaces in a way that I would have never imagined. So I thought, well, something we must have done right because they really imagined themselves in this house being designed by, for them in a very different way that I would imagine this uh, structure for me. We sure make sure that we never us, label the space so the plans and images and nothing had ne nothing directive on which space should be used for what because we didn't knew that. We just, as I said, promoted spaces with different qualities, physical qualities, but not to be used by certain activities. And um, well, we then, then endeavor a process with them to start uh, the construction of this house very soon. Um, we have also tried to understand how to do that in the vertical realm, how to promote the possibilities of community making. And one of the, and this is a roble, it's a building, a collective uh, living for of 150 units in Monterrey, in a city in the north uh, east of Mexico. And um, what we we really, our premise was. How do we create the possibility of encounter in a 150 unit building? And we said, well, we have to create those spaces. Those spaces that normally we have erased from society because they create conflicts. They have to be managed, they have to be, there are places where you need to talk, where you need to uh, understand what to do, what you need to care for. Yes, but those spaces create community. We have tend to erase them, you know, by uh, creating the most efficient ways of arriving to your unit if you live in this collective environment, to skip uh, any neighbor that you could poss possibly encounter. The ultimate solution is that elevator that brings you to your door of your house. You never even go to the hallway. Um, and we really erased that from this, our project and we decided how to orchestrate units with different spaces that kind of share or unify them, you know? So clusters of six space, six units with a room, on purpose room, clusters of eight with a terrace and, a, and an open space, uh, clusters of 20 with a more ambitious program like, uh, like a terrace and a room and, uh, and a rooftop. Uh, another, they, the other 40 that share a pool, you know, and things that really um, would allow more possibilities of encounter of, yes, conflict, but at the end, community making. This building is on, under construction. I don't know how this is going to, 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 to exist, but let's hope it also uh, uh, informs that. We have been also trying to understand how to translate that into the public realm, into really thinking um, that not only spaces should be kind of those uh, that define our domestic environments and the communities that can create, but how does that extend to other domains uh, in, in, in life? In, in this case, we did a university, a building for a university called UDEM, and UDEM uh, needed a building that would um, hold uh, much more uh, square meters, this is the one, the building we did, than they were built in the whole campus. And the purpose of this building would be to remove the cars that were spread out in the whole campus and put them all together. So a parking, a parking building for uh, 1,500 cars. But uh, the challenge was that this building, this university, little by little, wants to get rid of the cars first. Now, a day, now they already get, got rid of the cars from the campus. But in the future, they want to get rid all together from, from, uh, from their surroundings. They're working with the city. This is a project that really needs uh, 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 all that. And um, what we, what we wanted to understand is how to create a building for this transitional moment uh, that uh, will hold those 1,500 cars, but that in 20, 50 years, hopefully 20, but I would say it's more like 50, would completely eliminate those cars from the building, but the building would still exist. So how can a building that needs to be created for a very specific use could also hold a structure that would allow other possibilities to happen. 
So much more uh, kind of physically we did that, no? exposing the, the very strict structure of a grid that defines the building and holds the possibility of the parking, but that grid that gives space and possibilities for other things to exist, to bring a, a more human scale to the building, to give gave opportunity for the exterior to become part of the interior and to really be able to transform in the near future. I, I will just very quickly describe then um, how a, we have transgressed kind of from um, what it means to create spaces for communities, for cities, uh, into what are we thinking for the future. So um, we have been working 17 years in the botanical garden in Culiacán. Um, I'm not going to explain the project. It's very, very thorough. I think I did uh, five years ago. Um, and um, what, I, uh, what I thought uh, um, to show here today you know, is that, well, first of all, we have had this opportunity of working in this garden uh, in continues for 17 years that has allowed us to create the possibility of thinking um, how the people have inhabited those spaces that we created in order to continue thinking how to, 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 to really use them. And our first premise here was how to create little pavilions that just enhance the experience of the garden, uh, but doesn't really create a division between those uh, um, is spaces for, for different activities and the garden. So we wanted to create buildings that really become much more mediators between that uh, nature that is kind of very rough year round. The, the weather here also is very, very humid, very, very hot, even hotter than in the Mayan Peninsula. Uh, not the year round, in this case, uh, it really cools down in the winter. It's in Culiacán, it's a no city in the northwest of the country. And how can we really create this architecture that allows those bodies to perform a class or um, a, listen to a performance or to a, anything that could happen also in the auditorium, but not ban them completely from the experience of the garden, from, exper from the natural experience, from the natural environment that we belong to. Um, from our own ecosystem. So we started creating these architectures. As I said, I'm not, gonna, um, I'm not going to, to uh, describe them in detail, but that are the, the mediators of that. Because of that garden that we have been working all these years, we were called to um, think on how to consolidate this central park in Mazatlán this Central Park has a, um, is, Mazatlan is the second largest city of the same state where the Botanical Garden is. Uh, that's Culiacán and this is Mazatlan. Mazatlan, differently from Culiacán, is directly on the coast and has been a, a touristic city that uh, more and more has progressed to a service city, it has become very big. And uh, that really the, um, the, the city grew so much that it almost invaded the, all the natural important features of the, of the city, but this one. And it didn't because this has a natural regulated lagoon, as I said, that fluctuates. Uh, in, uh, in, in the level of the lagoon fluctuates through different uh, times of the year. And uh, so really they couldn't, they couldn't understand how to inhabit this, uh, this place. So uh, what, we, what we did is we understood that the necessity was to think how to mediate with the possibility of, uh, of using a space that sometimes, some parts are always flooded, some parts are sometimes flooded and sometimes dry, and sometimes are, uh, some parts are only dry. So in this case, I really thought it was very interesting. I mean, in, in, in some times of the year, this lawn that you see here is, is completely covered with water. And in this city, people is not used to, to understand the circles or cycles of seasons because the seasons are not so um, evident no, as in, in, in a place like this. In this city, it looks like the same season, but the seasons fluctuate. So the spaces, normally people are accustomed to use them the same way year round. 
But in this case, this pack really has a fluctuation. So I also thought it was important and necessary to enhance that possibility. We knew since we started designing this place with that strategy that two very big pieces of infrastructure would uh, appear, uh, a museum and an aquarium, and we were not designing those. Um, and what we wanted is that, uh, well, we, we just left them there. We knew that there was a specific design already commissioned for those two, and we were not thinking anything else. When we started consolidating the, the park and the lagoon, and we started even, um, people started using some parts of it, uh, we were called to redesign the aquarium. And for me, it was uh, the aquarium that was going to be in that corner. For me, that was a very difficult thought uh, because I have always thought of aquariums exactly as what this painting describes, man controller of the universe. An aquarium is that program where uh, really we, we, we expose our ideas on how we can dominate nature um, to the point that those parts of nature that we cannot access, we can bring it to us and we can put it over there. But I thought, I mean, uh, first of all, it was ridiculous to think on an aquarium when you are really in front of the most important aquarium of the world, a natural aquarium of the world, of course, which is the Sea of Cortez. And second of all, how could you really think of an aquarium there that would be holding penguins? <laughs> In, in the bottom of a, of a dome, it was already designed for that. The penguins were really beautifully put in a, in a dome. Underneath a, a dome, a transparent dome, I don't know how they would uh, uh, control the temperature there. But anyway, um, I, I was not uh, doing that, no? So uh, I told them my concerns, and they said, exactly that's our point. How can we do something that allow us to connect with our natural environment outside much better and than the building that is now uh, designed. So th that was very good because then I said, well, okay, let's find the people who really are doing that, how to connect with that nature. And we called the, the people from the aquarium in Vancouver and uh, which are uh, people that are doing, uh, they have an organization com called Ocean Wise, and they are like one of the most important world organizations protecting the seas. They have an aquarium in Vancouver and they're doing that. So we worked with them thinking how to create this sea, uh, research center of the Sea of Cortez that actually is really kind of uh, allowing us to understand how to interact with this world. And then how do we create a building for that? So we couldn't imagine that. Fortunately, it was the year 2300 when we arrived and we discovered that there was a building that was uh, completely um, flooded at some point because in the year 2100, uh, it was flooded. It was built in the year 2020. And the year 2100, it was flooded. In the year that we arrived, 2300, the water had receded and uh, the building had been taken by nature. Uh, it was completely invaded, and we arrived there only to create the possibility of two large spaces that would bring you to the roof, and that would allow you to discover the, the vegetation that implanted there, and that would bring you into the central space to start discovering how really nature had taken over this building and then how we could open little paths for, you, for us to enjoy how, how nature took over there. This building is now, is 2022, is being built and hopefully very soon being flooded in order for nature to invade it and uh, transform the existence of this building. Thank you very much. Tatiana. Tatiana is willing to take a few questions. And those of you who have questions, raise your hand because Neda will bring you the microphone since we're recording the event tonight. Uh, Nathan. Thank you so much. Tatiana, just real quick, on behalf of all the G3s, thank you so much for the time that you've given us today. We're really looking forward to the rest of the week with you. Um, you are attempting to break down the existing social structure uh, that exists in our society, whether that be how capitalism has driven our city planning or how reproductive labor 
things like being a parent are valued uh, at zero dollars uh, by our economy. You know, even just reimagining what a house is, is uh, a great example of this. So that being said, I was wondering, um, do you consider uh, your architecture to be a form of activism or perhaps a, a form of dissidence within this existing social structure? Uh, because like you said, we all have to eat, we all have to make money. Um, and have you viewed yourself as an activist and how do we as young professionals follow in those footsteps? If so, how do we basically become activists within this structure as well? Well, I don't think myself on, of, as an activist, but I'm sure um, I, I, I really think that there's nothing else I could do but being really critical uh, and stand to my beliefs. And if that makes me being labeled an activist, let it be. I have no issues, but, uh, but I, I really think that for me has become truly important to be very critical of every aspect of every precept that I've learned through life um, and think of it. Maybe, maybe I reaffirm and reassure the things I was doing and I repeat them, but there is also room when you do that to understand that probably they were not so correct or to learn how to enhance them, no? rather than thinking they were not correct. How to make them even um, better. I think um, there is a necessity, urgent necessity of all of us to start challenging the precepts and the system because for me there's really, as I said in the beginning, no other way than a systemic change. And we, it's very evidently, no? we're seeing it. The system is crumbling in all its aspects, environmentally, politically, economically, socially. So we really urgently need to rethink how to propose um, a systematic change. It is not possible for an architect to think that uh, I'm not that innocent, I am, but not that, to think that architecture can do that systemic change. But I think that architecture is the platform for our lives, it's shaping our lives. So if it's doing that, it can shape and can become a platform for other things to happen. If they happen or not, that's not the architect's or the architecture's responsibility. But if there's not even space for that, then how it's going to change, no? So I think I do, I'm the innocent person who thinks that architecture has an enormous power in our lives. Not architects, we don't have any. But architecture has an enormous power in our lives. And um, I do think also that architecture uh, provides a primary form of care. It's something we need to exist, whether it's a roof or whether it's a platform to uh, ex ex exalt, uh, en enhance our lives. It is an architecture, right? So thinking of that, we have a very big responsibility on how society is shaped. So let's think what is, how we want to do that architecture, no? That's what I think every day. And yes, I've been critical all the time, and I cannot do otherwise. I cannot surrender to, to, to other ways. No? If that doesn't happen, well, that doesn't happen. We find it in another place, but I continue with that. And yeah, call me an activist, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Tatiana. It's really a pleasure to welcome you here. I, um, the work is wonderful, and I wanted to speak a little bit about what I don't see, uh, because I think the power in your work and how you uh, enable your social agenda is what you don't do or what you remove. So on the level of representation, th there's no renders. Without the renders and when you do your collages, there's no walls. When you don't have the walls, you start to put holes into other surfaces, right? So there's a lot of removing uh, boundaries of program that you question, boundaries be, uh, that between inside and outside. All of this, um, these acts of absence, I think is actually your most powerful design strategy. So when you do build, how do you know, I'm curious as to how you know when to remove and when to add, because much of architecture is, we teach adding things, we rarely teach removing. Yeah, that's something I have been uh, trying to learn. So obviously what I would like is that the buildings that we do 
perform as the images that we create, no? And uh, this is why we needed to create a completely different way of representing um, representing our ideas because the tools we had didn't represent how we wanted our architecture to perform. So for me, there are exact representations of the things we want the architecture to be. Uh, probably they're not exact, direct, physical representations on what the architecture is. Those are the plans we produce because we do produce plans and sections and these things that they serve for building those buildings, right? So um, they, they, we know also where and how to use those images. On the topic of the, of the removal or the adding, um, I think of as architecture as a mediator no? between our, uh, the mediator within our ecosystem. I hope, I wish, and that it should be. No, right now it's a limit, it's a wall that it really prevents us to participate of that environment in many ways, sometimes even literally. No? Um, so I, would, um, I, I really think that when, when we start doing our architecture, we start thinking how to do that, not removing, maybe, not uh, limiting, not putting, not adding, but mediating. So what are those uh, elements that mediate and what are the definitions is how we do the architecture. Uh, maybe at the end they look like uh, add additions and walls and dividers, but if you really think thoroughly, uh, all those materials, all those moves, all those lines are, are thought and are placed there to become mediators between everything and the surroundings. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Other questions? Hi. Um, so you described the solo house as a module field wherein other can inhabit, uh, can inhabit specific to their needs. Um, however, in our discussions earlier, you expressed some hesitation to at least the word module as an imposition on a way of living. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that disconnect or maybe specify what you mean as a module or a framework in that. Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, in the case of uh, when I was speaking about the module, uh, the modularity of the, de the specific design strategy of the Housing Plus project, um, it's, it's of that, no? of the modulation as a strategy. In this case, it's a module as a, as a, as a frame, as a structure. No? So I think that it's different. In the, in the case of the, modula, the, the module or the design uh, strategy that is done with modules, um, it is restricting the possibility of, uh, of really a specific, because this is designed for people in rural areas in Mexico, no, is determine a way of inhabiting that doesn't correspond, for example, for the Maya community. No? They don't live with um, uh, buildings that divide and that they're modular in any way. No? So that is not allowing that to exist. So I think it really needs to be very well thought as where these things are being built. No, on the other hand, you're not going to build a Mayan house here because it doesn't correspond neither to the culture, to the weather, to, the, to nothing really. No? Uh, or with the Mayan materials. No? It's, I think you need to really understand how those strategies and for where are. I mean, for me, one of the problems is the thought that if something is being able to be modularized in order to be carried out in uh, anywhere. That is the problem because uh, it's kind of thinking that one size fits all, uh, but it, in, the, in reality, no, when you go to those stores, one size fits all, they fit nobody. <laughs> you, they don't fit anybody. So that's my point, you know, how to understand when, where, what is the strategy for what. And in the house plus, as I said, being thought for rural areas in Mexico, I don't think it works because they don't respond to the way of any of these 67 cultures inhabit the planet, you know. Um, maybe you can use it for a specific project in a city block for specific purposes that has a specific needs, you know. But I, I would say that for me much more is uh, the idea of the modularity applied to, to 
everywhere that I think is wrong. Um, you mentioned a little bit about this, like in the solo house, about how like you are trying to navigate like um, architecture, not like imposing you know this Western um, understanding of distribution of spaces, and actually like real life work, which is like submitting plans and sections, and for it to actually go through, because it's entrenched in law, like this Western understanding, like about how spaces should be uh, organized. Have you like collaborated within your work, or have you considered your work to be interdisciplinary, like to cross like uh, architecture to collaborate with like urban planners or city planners to maybe even change the laws of understanding how space is like uh, aside from the colonial way that we understand like the Western way, how we understand like kitchens and bedrooms and stuff like that. I mean, what I think is that we shouldn't. I I cannot imagine myself me changing because exactly that's the problem. <laughs> I think we should all you know, be defining how we, uh, we should inhabit this planet. You know? We should all have the right ourselves to live our own way and therefore create our own precepts. That is a, a very big utopic way of thinking and uh, that is something that probably won't uh, happen ever you know, uh, because of the structures in which we live in, you know, and obviously how society is built, and yeah, also very soon we're not going to see the cha the real systemic change that I, I am even talking about, you know. But I think that um, it is really important to to give platforms for people to really take stands, right? That is what we can do right now, us, us people of privilege, because all of us that are here are very privileged to be uh, in, a, in, a, in an institution like this, uh, with an education like probably the majority of the people here, and I don't dare to say everybody has, um, it's a very small part of percentage of the population. So we that have these uh, privileged positions should start thinking how to create platforms for anyone to be represented in this society and move a step backwards to become those platforms too allow others to raise up. 